This is 8.5, um, and we're back to talking about pancakes. Um, this time we're going to talk about limiting reactants, theoretical yields, and percent yields. So back to that pancake recipe, which isn't a very good recipe. Um, if we had three cups of flour in the house and ten eggs and four teaspoons of baking powder, how many pancakes could we make? Is that something that you can just know instantly by looking at it? Not really. How could we figure that out? Well, if we have one cup of flour, we can make five pancakes. So there's five pancakes for every cup of flour. We have three cups of flour. If we used up all the flour, we could make how many pancakes? Fifteen, right? So these are the sorts of things that we could do in our heads, but we're also going to write them out. Three cups of flour, and we know from this recipe that it's five pancakes for every one cup of flour. So that would make 15 pancakes, right? My mental calculator's been a little off lately. How many pancakes could we make with 10 eggs? Well, 10 eggs, we get five pancakes for every how many eggs? Two eggs, right? So 10 times 5 is 50 divided by 2 is 25. We have enough eggs to make 25 pancakes. Can we make 25 pancakes? No, because at 15 pancakes we run out of flour. Can you make pancakes without flour? No. That looks like uh, really fluffy scrambled eggs or something, right? Eggs and baking powder? That doesn't sound like a good combination. We have four tisps, four teaspoons of baking powder, BP. To make five pancakes, it takes half a teaspoon, so 0.5 teaspoons. Of baking powder. So that would make 40 pancakes. We're going to do this same process with chemicals next. But what are we doing here? We're taking each of the ingredients and we're figuring out how much product could we make. If I used up all the flour, I could make 15 pancakes. If I used up all the eggs, I could make 25 pancakes. If I use a ball of baking powder, I could make 40 pancakes. But the actual number that we can make is the smallest of those numbers, right? We're making pancakes, we make 5 pancakes, 10 pancakes, 15 pancakes, bang, we have to stop. Because we ran out of one ingredient. That ingredient is limiting how many pancakes we can make. Which ingredient is limiting the number of pancakes? The flour. We're running out of flour. And that's often how it is when you're baking, isn't it? You never have just the right amount to make like four recipes of, of uh, cookies or something. You've always got lots of something else and there's always one thing you're running out of. And sometimes there's two or three things that you're running out of. And you end up going to Fresh and Easy four times in one day. Done that. It's very sad. So here's the picture. If this was a chemical reaction, we would say that the flour is the limiting reactant. It's the ingredient that limits how much we can make. And 15 pancakes would be the theoretical yield. In theory, we could make 15 pancakes. Do things sometimes go wrong when you're making pancakes? Yeah. If you're trying to get fancy and like flip them in the air, they could fall on the floor, right? Or you could get distracted by the telephone and leave them on the pan and they burn. 
So you don't always make 15 pancakes even though the recipe says you could, right? So that's the theoretical yield. So we're cooking our pancakes. We burn three of them and one falls on the floor. We had enough stuff to make 15 pancakes, but we ended up with 11. And that's kind of realistic, you know, stuff happens. So if this was a chemical reaction, we would say that 11 pancakes is our actual yield. There's the theoretical yield. If everything works perfectly, that's how much we could make. And then the actual yield is generally going to be smaller because something's going to happen. Okay? That's the actual yield. Any questions about those terms or concepts? It, makes, it, it, it tends to make sense with pancakes. If it makes sense with pancakes, it makes sense with chemicals too. Okay? So keep your mind open. Um, and then percent yield. Percent is part over whole. The part that we're interested in, which is how many pancakes we actually made, divided by the theoretical yield. So they don't give, they don't really give you a, um, a specific equation here. Percent yield is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield. times 100%. And we use percent yield quite a bit. It's a measure of the efficiency of your, of your reaction. And if you get out into industry, um, that's a really important thing to consider. So in this situation, our percent yield was 73%. We made 11 pancakes out of a possible 15. We're doing okay. So the actual yield of a, chemis, of, a, of a chemical reaction has to be determined experimentally. It's going to depend on the reaction conditions. It can be different. You gave the same ingredients and the same recipe and everything to three different people in three different kitchens. They may come up with three different actual yields. You know, Martha Stewart over here is going to make 15 perfectly round pancakes, right? You know, and Joe Schmo over there might only get two out because he couldn't figure out which side of the pan to put them on or something. You know, you never know. The actual yield can change from time to time. The actual yield is not something that you can just calculate. And so when we give you problems on a test or in the homework, the actual yield will be given to you. In a lab situation, the actual yield is the amount of product that you actually come up with. The theoretical yield is always calculated, usually from the balanced chemical equation using stoichiometry, which is what we've been learning about. So the actual yield is almost always, almost always, less than 100%. This can happen because some of the product doesn't form or some of the product is lost in the, pro lost in the process of recovering it. How could, this is almost always, it's like we went to the Grand Canyon with a three-year-old and I was so nervous because there's these signs that say most of the injuries caused were because people didn't obey the signs. That's a paraphrase. Most. That means that somebody who obeyed all the rules and stayed on the sidewalk got hurt, they fell in or something, you know, because the sidewalk caved out from under them, or like, nice, that's really scary. Okay, almost always, almost always less than 100%. How could you make more than what you can theoretically make? Well, in theory, you can't. But what can happen is um, your, your product can be contaminated. When I was in um, quant lab, in college, we, were, we did very, very precise work, in it, and we were graded entirely on how good of a percent yield we had. That was your grade. You know, if it was like 95% to 100, then you got an A and blah, blah, blah. And so we, we'd been working on this for hours, and we were ashing samples and crucibles. So we had them here, and we're burning them. And this guy <laughs> at the next bench, there was... It was, a, it was a room kind of like this, with the windows that opened and no screens. And there was a fly in the room, and he flew over the crucible 
and it was hot, and he fell into the crucible and burned up. What's that going to do to the mass of your sample? It's going to make it higher than it's supposed to be. So if a fly falls into your product, then your, react, your, your percent yield could end up greater than 100%. Did you actually make more than you can theoretically make? No, there's something in there. Or if your sample is supposed to be dry and it's not quite dry, you're going to have the mass of water in there. There's other ways to have contaminants. So what that guy did, was very creative, he went around the building and he caught 10 flies and he ashed them and he determined the average mass of an ashed fly and he <laughs> subtracted that from his product. Isn't that good? That was faster than redoing the whole experiment. So sometimes the yield can be greater than 100%, but that means that something went wrong. So, summary. The limiting reactant, and these terms are important, is sometimes called the limiting reagent, is the reactant that is completely consumed. That's the one that you use up. You're going to have the rest of them be some left over. That one limits how much you can make, how much product. The theoretical yield is the amount of product that can be made theoretically if you use up all the limiting reactant. The actual yield is the amount you actually make. And the percent yield is the actual divided by the theoretical times 100%. Any questions? We're going to do some chemical examples now. So titanium plus chlorine gives titanium 4 chloride. Just a little review from chapter 7. What kind of a reaction is that? It's a synthesis reaction. Very good. We have two reactants combining to form one product. There's one other way that you should be able to classify that. Metal reacting with a nonmetal. It's a redox reaction, an oxidation reduction reaction. Because over here in the reactant, um, this is titanium metal. It's the element, it has no charge. Over here, this is a metal and a nonmetal, that's an ionic compound. So the titanium has lost some electrons. Oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. So that can be classified as a synthesis reaction and also as a redox or oxidation reduction reaction. Okay, that was just a little bonus you got. Um, so the question is, what are the limiting reactant and the theoretical yield if you start with 1.8 moles of titanium and 3.2 moles of chlorine? And I'm going to add something. Uh, the theoretical yield in moles. It should specify what unit it wants your answer in, and it doesn't. So the theoretical yield in moles. So those are the steps. We're going to use stoichiometry, which we learned in the earlier part of this chapter, to find the amount of product that can be made from each reactant. The same thing we did with the pancakes. If we use up all the titanium, how much product can we make? If we use up all the chlorine, how much product can we make? Then we're going to look at the and find which one is smaller. That's the easy part. Compare two or three numbers and find out which one's the smallest. So the limiting reactant is the one that gives you the smaller yield, and the theoretical yield is the smaller yield. So those are the three basic steps. So we'll get rid of all that stuff so we have some room to work. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the moles of titanium, um, 1.8 moles of titanium, and we're going to figure out how many moles of product we can make. So we're going to use the mole ratio. This is just moles to moles. Um, don't really have anywhere I could write this. I'll, I'll put it up here. We talked about our map or our path for stoichiometry being this. Grams to moles to moles to grams. Sometimes we tried to make it easier for you, and we just have you do the middle part. Okay, and then students get kind of 
crazy and they think, but there's got to be grams in there somewhere. And so they switch it up and they go moles to grams to grams to moles. And they get this big complicated thing going on and it doesn't work. And you get the answer wrong. We were trying to be nice to you and give you an easier problem. So don't lose your mind when you look at these things. Grams to moles to moles to grams. But we're giving, you're starting with moles and you're ending with moles. So you get to cut the ends off of the map. We dropped you down in the middle, and we're saying you don't have to get all the way to the end. So we're just going moles to moles, one step. Moles titanium, we're going to multiply by moles of TiCl4. We're going to divide by moles of titanium because we want those units to work out. Then we look at the balanced chemical equation, and we see, well, what number is in front of TiCl4? There's no number. It's a really skinny one. It's so skinny you can't see it. It's a one. Chemists don't like to write ones. What's in front of TI? An unwritten one. So for every mole of titanium, we're going to have the same number of moles of product. You might say, well, I could see that looking at it. Well, good for you. It doesn't usually work out that way. Then we have to figure out, well, what if we use up all the chlorine? 3.2 moles of chlorine. Well, we're still trying to figure out how many moles of titanium for chloride we can make, TiCl4. This time we're going to divide by moles of Cl2 because we want those guys to cancel out. We look at the equation again. There's still a 1 in front of the TiCl4, unwritten 1. In front of the Cl2, there's a 2. So we're going to take this 3.2, and that's going to give us 1.6 moles of titanium chloride. Now, in, on a multiple choice exam, and on the online homework, you're forced to give the answer and not just show work like this. But on, on a lab report, you could just write this and think you're done. This isn't done. We did the work. Now we have to choose the answers. We choose the answers by looking at those two numbers, 1.8 and 1.6, and saying, oh, 1.6 is smaller. This is the theoretical yield you need to actually choose one and indicate what it is. The limiting reactant, we, we see this is the smaller one, and then we look back and see which one did that come from. It came from the chlorine. That is our limiting reactant. Whoops. Okay. Limiting reactant, LR. Any questions? Let that sink in for a second. The same thing that we did with the pancake recipe. But now it's not whole numbers, is it? And it's not things that we're familiar with. Same process. Let's do another one. Here is another combination reaction. Sodium and fluorine reacting to form sodium fluoride. This is also a redox reaction, metal and a nonmetal. Here it says if you begin with 4.8 moles of sodium and 2.6 moles of fluorine, what's the limiting reactant and theoretical yield of sodium fluoride in moles? And here the question is written better and they tell, tell you in moles. So we're going to do that same process. Another point, how do you recognize that you need to do that process? How do you recognize that this is a limiting reactant problem and not one of the ones from earlier in the chapter where you just, you know, take your reactant and, and solve for the amount of product? They're giving you two numbers. They're giving you information about two of the reactants. So on your paper, you should write that balanced chemical equation, and I forgot to do this on the previous example. And then take that information, 4.8 moles of sodium. So under there, write 4.8 moles. I have 4.8 moles of sodium, and I have 
moles of fluorine. So I'm going to write 2.6 moles under fluorine in the equation. Then the question, what's the limiting reactant? Okay, we'll pass that one by for now. What's the theoretical yield of sodium fluoride in moles? So our question is over here, question mark, number of moles. If you have one number and one question mark, you just solve it. If you have two numbers, you have a limiting reactant problem, and you need to do two equations. Same process, you just have to do two of them. So we're going to take the sodium and find out how much product we can make, and we're going to take the fluorine and find out how much product we can make. And again, from the grams to moles to moles to grams, we're starting in the middle. Okay, we're just doing this part. We're chopping the ends off so it's easier. So 4.8 moles of sodium. And we want to figure out how many moles of sodium fluoride. So we need to multiply by moles of sodium fluoride and divide by moles of sodium. We look at the equation. There's a 2 in front of sodium. We put a 2 in front of sodium. There's also a 2 in front of sodium fluoride, so we put a 2 up there. These units cancel out. You may recognize that the 2's cancel out, and you're going to end up with 4.8 moles of sodium fluoride. So that's step one, well, part of step one. And then we have to take the other one, 2.6 moles of fluorine. And again, we're going to multiply by sodium fluoride. And we're going to divide by, this time, moles of fluorine. Sometimes students get um, mixed up, and instead of calculating the mass of product for both of these, they calculate the mass of one of the other reactants or something. Um, you're, you're trying to find amount of product. And, and in some problems, there'll be more than one product. They're going to ask you about just one of them, though. And so we have to put the numbers in here, 2.6 moles of fluorine, uh, there's a 2 in front of sodium fluoride, and there's an implied 1 in front of the fluorine. And so I believe that comes out to 5.2 moles of sodium fluoride. So we did our two equations. Now we look at our two answers and we pick the smaller one. 4.8 is smaller. This is our theoretical yield. And we go back and see which reactant did that come from, and that's our limiting reactant. It's not enough to just do the two equations. You actually have to pick the two answers. The smaller yield is the theoretical yield. You can't make any more because when you've made 4.8, you've run out of sodium. Question? Will they ever be equal? Will they ever be equal? They could be. Well, then your theoretical yield is the same. Yeah, either way. And then you don't actually have a limiting reactant. It's very unusual. Just like it's very unusual to set out to make cookies at your house and find out that you have exactly enough sugar and brown sugar and baking powder and chocolate chips and flour and eggs, right? Could, could that happen? It could happen. How likely is that? Not very likely, right? In a, in a real chemical reaction, there's almost always one thing that limits. But that's a good question. Any other questions? This is not the only way to solve these problems. And if you took high school chemistry and remember how to do problems like this and were taught a different way, you can go ahead and use that way. Okay? I'm just, I don't want to confuse people. And I find that this method, which is what your book teaches, is the one that's the least confusing for most students.